Yeah, I'll be talking about the official Dutch COVID-19 dashboard. And to give a little bit of a background, uh, I'm Jan. I work at Clever Franke, and we are a data design and technology consultancy. And we were, two years ago, the, the Dutch government, the Ministry of Health, reached out to us and asked for help building a dashboard about COVID. And obviously we said yes, because one, it's a cool topic, two, we're very glad to help out. Um, but it was an interesting, it's a bit of an interesting dynamic because we are a studio, we don't work for the government. So we were a little bit under the radar. And another interesting thing is I think for the first 12, 18 months, we were fully anonymous, um, which was great. Actually, we could just work, uh, do our best work, uh, give the ministry all the credits um, and just do our thing. And that actually led to us using, dare I say, a, a quite modern stack, uh, especially when you consider that it is an official government project. So let's just dig in. Uh, this is how it looks in one of the latest versions. Uh, before I actually start, I want to make a small uh, disclaimer that after a certain point, about two years in the project, a year and a half, um, us and the government, well, we didn't really split ways, but we transferred maintenance of the project and further development of the project to a different party. Um, so, so whatever is live now, you, we did a big part of it, but we can't take credits for all the latest changes and the latest enhancements. Um, and what was interesting about this is, in a way, this was a true agile project. Like we really started with a really small V1 because, you know, it's a crisis. Like it's definitely the first time that I encountered a pandemic or lived through a pandemic. Uh, so we needed to get something online as quick as possible. There was uh, not a lot of time. I wanted to have a lot of value. And that way we slowly build it up. So first a V1, then a V2, a V3. Uh, and the interesting part is V1, we started really on a macro level, um, like very factual. These are the big numbers about the Netherlands. You know, this is how we're doing and the more time we had, the more refinements we could make. And after a while, we could shift focus a little bit more to like a local micro level, like how is your municipality doing? Um, and we could also shift a little bit more to a narrative style. So add articles. And timeline. So the first release was in June 2020, which I think COVID first started appearing in Europe around March. Um, and we started working on this project somewhere in May, if I remember correctly. So there was a really short turnover time. And then a couple of months later, we released version two with a couple of big, nice enhancements, better navigation. And sometime later, we released version three, way more refined, but I'll show those later. So this in essence is, is Version one, is, it was a really simple, almost a one-pager website. A uh, couple of tiles with the most important information we needed at the time. Um, and nothing more than that. There were a couple of things that we could say about regional um, numbers, but only two tiles. You know, it, it was very small. Um, and these are some components we built at the time. And one of the design principles that, that this is important for the rest of the talk and for the full context is, yes, it's a crisis and we needed to get something live fast, but at the same time, it's the government. And, you know, the information we present needs to be reliable, it needs to be accessible. It's important that, that it's not easy to, to be hacked or, or be changed by a third party. 
So what we did at the, at the start is make a decision. Everything we do is static, static HTML, static CSS, um, static web server, no Node.js, just get something live in its basic form. So you, we're using Next export. And we publish those things with a Docker container where you can see, I'm not going through the whole image container thing, uh, but we're serving a very simple static Nginx server as basic as could be. Something that was a little bit less basic is from the start, we also decided that at some point, maybe not the first release, um, but we want to have a multi-language environment. So what we did very naively, build an NL JSON file, English JSON file, import those. And based on the process environment variable uh, public locality, we would switch JSON file and that's it. You know, that's multi-language done. And in the beginning, what we actually did was just run the Docker container twice, once in Dutch, once in English. You've got two containers, put them on different servers, uh, load balancer and done. And yeah, so we started on May 29th, which was a Friday, I believe. Worked through the weekend. Uh, my colleagues went through the Ministry of Health and, you know, they did designs there and workshops. And we went live on June 4, which I think is six or seven days total, probably four work days officially. Uh, but it was insane how fast we could have something live. Then version two became a bit bigger. As you can see, there's a bit more copy here. There's some updates going on. There's more information. And, you know, remember those, those, those English JSON files, Dutch JSON files, they grew a little. Um, at a certain point, we started adding these ICU syntax like variables in the in the text which worked but became a bit cumbersome and even worse some configuration values started to be added to these files and you know it works it's great and the awesome thing about it is it's all in the repo all the configuration all the data was in the repo everything was open sourced everything could be verified but maintenance wise not the easiest thing to do um, at some point, we switched to localize, um, which worked for a while, you know, to manage translations through a, a UI. But we found out it had a couple of downsides. Um, the things it's actually great at is like verifying that the changes you made are right. You know, have a nice QA step, merge them in your repo, and take your time slowly to do that. Uh, but we found out that that wasn't really the workflow we needed. The workflow we needed was maybe five minutes before we do a daily update with new data, we need to change a couple of words. That was somewhat difficult to do with localize. Uh, and at some point what we also did was questions came in, can we have bold text? Can we have hyperlinks in our copy? Um, well, you know, the, the, the quick answer is yes, we can. We just add some markdown syntax to it, add snarkdown to, uh, to the front end, and we can show it that way. But what we essentially did was we basically abused localize as a CMS, which you shouldn't do. Uh, and another thing is this is what I just was talking about, you know, the workflow. Every time we wanted to do an update of, of the dictionary files, we had to make a PR. Sometimes that went wrong. Depending on which user was locked in, it would use different export settings. And it was really difficult to, uh, to teach the right settings to all of the users that should have access to, to localize. So that's when we started thinking about alternatives. Talking about alternatives. So version three. All the most important work was done. This was the, the part of the, the, the crisis where the vaccines became um, a topic. 
So there's a chart we made with, with vaccine data. There's a, a nice little ticker on the right that showed how many people get vaccinated every day or per minute. And like I said, a big topic of V3 was um, storytelling. So we want to write articles and we want to share those articles and, and put some metadata in there that's good for SEO, bigger micro copy. And thus we introduced sanity. Um, because I knew we wanted to, to move away from localized to make things a bit easier to use anyway. And we wanted to add that block to the, the front end. So this is one of the first things we did. Just how do we move away from localized to something more scalable, maintainable for the project we're building? And well, one of the, the easy things is, you know, make a schema locality string. Um, supported languages is an array with at the time was just uh, Dutch and English. And then you have a string, but in two languages. And you can use that. So one of the first things we built with it was the frequently asked questions section, which needed to be in Dutch and English uh, and needed a little bit more um, formatting, you know, like a couple of paragraphs, some bold text, some titles. So this was a um, relatively quick way of doing that, multi-language and done. And the great thing about using Sanity for this, for us, was how flexible with what you know like um i wish i could say i made a really refined studio like uh, <laughs> the previous talk had a really nice looking studio and i'm a bit jealous of it ours is a bit more there i say functional um but we just needed something to work and we did have a great api though with sanity and one of the things like i said at the beginning is we wanted static exports so what we could do and, and what we have done is create all of these helper files to help us manage translations. And this is one of the most important ones for developers. So we made a little command line interface to get the most current or the most uh, fitting translations into your local environment. Like you would need these when, when you're working on the front end. Um, for static export. Oh, wait, yeah, this is um, like one of our Grok queries where we say we want to get all the, the localized texts, but don't give us the drafts because those are for tomorrow, probably, because we had daily updates. And what we also did was, you know, if you combine those things together, like get me all of the documents that are of type dictionary, uh, flatten them or unflatten them, and you can see here, here's the, the NL JSON and the English JSON. We did add a underscore export to it, uh, but we would write out these dictionary files statically in the Docker container. So there was no API connection between Sanity and the dashboard once we went live every day. So there was a database connection while developing it or when previewing it on a special preview server but not once we've deployed it, you know. So that made it very resilient. Um, another interesting thing is, I mean, once you have that data, once you have those JSON files, once you have those things already in, in a Node.js environment, um, what you can do is some clever tricks like this, where we write a TypeScript definition. Um, I had a bit of trouble getting this started locally and, and could, I, I can't show everything working at the moment, but this would give you really nice feedback in your editor in VS Code. Like, you know, you're trying to access this translation, but that key doesn't exist. So either add that key in Sanity or, I don't know, import the texts again. So you get some really nice feedback that way. Um, yeah, and, and this is then the studio where we've transferred all of the, the locality files from localize into Sanity. Um, we decided to keep the term localize because 
the content managers were already used to it, um, even though I would probably name it something else now. Uh, but they were used to it, so they knew where to find it. Um, they could update all of their strings here. They knew that they could keep it in draft mode if they wanted to publish it later, or they could publish it if they wanted it to be live for the next release. Um, yeah, so frequently asked questions. I just showed those as well. Um, those are uh, just documents, and we, we added them to groups. And this is using the um, the, the multi-language string configuration. We also built this language switcher. You can see in the top right where we can switch between Dutch and English. Um, we found out that after a while, the, the, the studio just has a lot of information if you show Dutch and English for every field you need to fill in. So we made this a filter. So you just fill in Dutch first and then you switch to English. So this is the English view. Um, and then it became time to refine more, you know, like all of the essential features are done. And now we could really spend some time on making sure the UX was top notch. Um, and we worked a lot on accessibility. So here are some more charts. I'm actually gonna show a video uh, where we show some of these accessibility features and UX features in action. So I'm, I'm just gonna let it play for a while. Oh, I had my slides confused. This is actually a different video. This video is about the articles. And I remember Kitty showing something like this in a previous talk. Um, so you can write an article in the article, you can actually add a chart, and then there's the chart configuration on the right here. And that allowed people to make these really cool, engaging articles they could share on social media with specific charts in them that showed the relevant topic at the time. Um, I'll be honest, there was some developer capacity needed here because, you know, like source key, title key, difference key, you need to know which keys to use. So it's not completely foolproof, but it was really easy for us to use and, and to, to, to generate new articles quickly with these nice interactive charts in them. So this is the video with accessibility optimizations. Figures for the Netherlands. Jump to the menu for data points. Measures there are national measures. Vaccinations vaccine doses administered 10,907,972 million nine hundred seven thousand nine hundred seventy two million eighty six. Average number over the past seven days. Bullet two hundred thirty five point six. So here's the studio and I'll, I'll make the screen a little bit bigger so you can ever, everybody can see it. It's not the prettiest studio. Uh, we really focused on functionality first instead of making it the most easy to use, straightforward uh, CMS. But it does the job and once you know where to find things, you know, this is quite easy to update. Um, One of the interesting things we found, or one of the most useful things at the time was in the dashboard, 
where we added these sections that say, um, hey, there's documents you didn't publish yet, or this one, which says, hey, there's actually um, these, these multi-language text, these localized strings that you didn't translate into English yet. So this was really helpful um, for the content managers to see, okay, what do I still need to translate? Because otherwise the English version is um, out of sync with the Dutch version uh, and the new ones that were recently published, which um, is also quite useful because usually when updating these dashboards, um, you're working on like one very important topic in a couple of weeks. And there's a lot of focus on these recent localized texts for a little bit. And then they just, you know, they, they sink to the bottom and they don't get updated as much anymore. Um, one thing that we also just saw, what I want to show is the charts. And I know it's not really, uh, well, it is partly related to sanity. So these charts, you can hover over them and you see the values per day. But one of the things you can also do is use your cursor keys to go through them. And like we just saw in the video, this will also announce it to a screen reader what's happening. Um, and if this doesn't go fast enough, you know, press shift, you can make bigger jumps and go through it. And if we get to this little bit darker blue area here, or, yeah, it says test because I'm working from a, a test data set here. Uh, or actually, this is uh, this is when they started testing the, the sewage data. Um, these annotations in the charts, these are actually coming from Sanity. So this is part of the whole uh, chart builder configuration thing where they could update tasks, uh, texts, add annotations to the charts uh, and make it all a bit more dynamic and lively. Um, we can go back to the keynote by actually, yeah, no, that was it, Cap. So feel free to jump back <laughs> and I'm ready for questions. All right on, thank you so much for that presentation. I loved it. Ooh, we lost Cap. Lose Cap. For a second, I, I'll just say thanks so much for uh, for the presentation. I mean, uh, it's really cool to see uh, uh, what was going on there with the uh, with the keyboard uh, stuff that you just yeah. Heard. It was really cool that we had uh, the time to do that. Actually, you know, working for the government, accessibility is important. I mean, it's important. It's an important topic anyway. But but I think the government is one of the few clients that actually pays you to do accessibility audits and. Yeah, it's the time to actually focus on it. So we also really enjoyed it as a studio to to build these little enhancements. You know, it's it's kind and of I imagine good. you've gone through a lot of like accessibility audit process there too, right? Absolutely, we did uh, we did multiple um, user interviews, uh, focus sessions. There were a lot of uh, UX research uh, sessions happening, and we also had specific sessions with people with a disability. Uh, and we could see how they were using the dashboards, you know, not just in general, but like what the things were that they were struggling with. Um, right, like the user journeys and stuff that they were taking or the... Yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, it was really enlightening to see the, the, the things they had difficulty with. And the great news is we could fix that immediately. Yeah. Um, and yeah, historically, I would say DataVis is a difficult topic with accessibility anyway, you know, like there's so much data. Like if you saw those line charts, what is it? 300, 400 data points. How, how do you yeah. make that accessible? Because accessible, um, I mean, it has, it has multiple meanings, right? Like I, I can give you all of the information, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to use or that it that it's accessible to you to get that information. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it's maybe hard to see what you're uh, what you're doing. Yeah. Hey, you're back. Hey, welcome back, Cap. 
<laughs> my house just like lost power and came back. Anyway. Wow. Oh, we, we were just putting uh, accessibility for a bit. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I have one last question that came from the community uh, from Martin. Uh, there he wondered about these uh, different languages that you have because there's English and, and Dutch. Yeah. Would you have you chosen like a different strategy? Uh, would you have had more languages? Like if you had a lot more languages, would you have chosen a different strategy? No, not at all. Um... No, I mean we could we could have changed the filter to be easier to use. Um, no, I think this is just how it how it organically grew. You know, like we started with a really small app with, you know, the dictionary file in the beginning was like fifty lines. You know, you just copy paste that, rename it to English JSON, and you're done, and that works. Uh, but then it slowly grew to be bigger and bigger. Uh, and that that's actually one of the points that I wanted to make, and I, I completely forgot about it. So so it's good that that question came up. Uh, yeah. The thing about sanity that was most appealing to me while building this thing was I felt completely okay with making mistakes. If I would make a mistake in the schema, I knew I could always do a migration, you know, or... I could change things along the way as we went. Uh, and I'll, that happened actually, you know, like if we made mistakes, it was fine. We could just change the configuration and, and, and solve it. So. Yeah, it seemed like you've gone through a lot of iterations, like yeah. different versions and, and changing things based on how the world changed. And the, the world changed a lot in, in that. Those, uh... Yeah, yeah. And, and also the, um, the technical, um, considerations, they also slowly evolve over time because you start with this concept of it needs to be fully static at all times, you know, like because it's the most resilient way to build an app. And then very, very slowly, we got a bit more leeway to do things differently. Um, yeah. So we could have built a different API from the start, knowing what we know now. But, um, no, I'm actually very happy with Sanity for for managing translations. The only thing we, um, well, I'm not going to say we should have done it better, but you know, like I said, these things grow over time. The only thing I would want to see different is uh, we should have made a clearer distinction maybe between what's content and what's copy. You know, like right. putting those markdown in, in the language string files, that, that, that was the the part where it went wrong for me. <laughs> Temporary solution, right? <laughs> we recovered because we went to portable text after that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. This was uh, this was really cool. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, for your talk. Um, for everyone, you can find Jan in the community Slack and uh, also on Twitter. Uh, we'll share the Twitter handle in in the chat, so you can ask Jan more questions even uh, after this. I'm sure people will have more questions. Uh, as well, um, yeah. Thanks so much uh, again for uh, for joining us today. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah, thank uh, you, Jan. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. All right. Cheers. <laughs>